Now, in, uh, in talking about the Enlightenment, how are we going to characterize the Enlightenment in general and um, accordingly uh, understand Locke as representative of the Enlightenment, and in many regards, the beginning of the philosophical Enlightenment, sometimes dated from uh, 1691, which was the date of publication of his essay concerning human understanding. Sometimes, sometimes that's taken to mark the beginning of the philosophical Enlightenment. Well, um, the term Enlightenment, of course, refers to the light of reason, which in that context means the light of scientific knowledge, the light of knowledge gained by those objective scientific methods, uh, whether inductive or deductive, at least with the kind of objectivity that uh, science claimed and the kind of conclusiveness which science then claimed. Uh, you remember the lines of Tennyson, um, God said, let Newton be and all was light. You think, why pick Newton if it's not the light of science? Now, the, the Enlightenment then, with its emphasis on reason, was skeptical of tradition, skeptical of authority, um, frequently gave no place to revelation. Uh, insofar as there were Christians participating in the Enlightenment, and um, therefore, um, talking about revelation, it's more of an add-on, something in addition to what we know by reason alone, rather an add-on than an underlying perspective that helps us understand the rest. Uh, this was um, an age very much opposed to dogmatic systems, which is why the big system builders, Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, are early 17th century rather than 18th century Enlightenment people. Uh, because those system builders claim a kind of systematic knowledge which could not be established by scientific means alone. Remember the problems that um, you seem to find even, no, I don't mean you even, uh, but <laughs> you seem to find even in Descartes, uh, where uh, his proofs didn't seem to be all that um, uh, they were supposed to be. Uh, it's an age of criticism, criticizing the very possibility of such knowledge. And so it's not surprising that the Enlightenment mind turned inward on itself. And Enlightenment thinkers started criticizing the claims of the Enlightenment and of scientific knowledge. So that when we get to David Hume, we'll find that he um, is really a philosophical skeptic. He's skeptical about that kind of Enlightenment knowledge, objective, with certainty. Yes, sir. He's skeptical about the very possibility of that and develops in its place uh, an account of how belief arises and seems to be justified, uh, as distinct from that dogmatic kind of knowledge. Uh, David Hume was not um, alone in that. Uh, figures like Voltaire, or uh, a group in France um, known as the Philosophers, or as um, the French word, which still means the Philosophers, but um, I guess to distinguish it from other philosophers, they're usually spoken of in English by the French term. They philosoph, a uh, group of philosophical skeptics about the possibility of knowledge. Um, now, it's not only the age of the light of reason, it's also the age of the rule of reason. That is to say, the rule of reason, not only in our thinking, but in our living. The rule of reason in our living. And so the, the idea is that when we're ruled by reason, we are freed from other causal conditions. If we act, that is to say, out of impulse, emotional impulse, we're not free. We're driven, like Avis, driven. You think. But, um, you missed that one. Um, you know the Avis ad, don't you? We're driven. Has Avis stopped advertising that way? <laughs> oh, sorry, I'll have to change. Um, all right, if you act out of emotional compulsion, you're not acting freely, you're driven. Um, it's only when um, you are able to detach yourself by standing back and thinking about what you do, detach yourself from the emotional compulsion, that you're really free. You see? So freedom is possible under the rule of reason. As we say in political matters, it's possible. Political freedom is possible under the rule of laws. But not where there are no laws. We must be detached from the compulsive in order to be free. And uh, consequently, uh, you, you find uh, ethical theories uh, developing which are concerned with knowing what is right. And the medievals, the concern was the good. That is to say, the ideal towards which we strive in seeking the highest good, God. But in the Enlightenment, the emphasis on ethics is more on uh, principles and rules that enable us to know what is the right thing to do in this and every other case after the same kind of detached objectivity and certainty in ethics as was claimed in science. And it was the age, therefore, in which theories of individual rights developed. Uh, John Locke, um, with his emphasis on the rights to life, liberty, and property, and other theories of rights that are the foundation of um, the French um, political heritage, and of course, the American political heritage. Uh, our political system is essentially a product of the Enlightenment, very much so. The rule of laws governed by constitution represents the rule of reason. So um, this is the, the characteristic. And in the reaction against that skepticism about the light of reason, you know, the rejection of the rule of reason, uh, yeah, that developed in Romanticism in the early 19th century. 
where romanticism reverts to the freedom of the, uh, of the emotion, uh, the creative genius who idealizes what freedom is like. So that um, some commentators have pointed out that what you get beginning in the Renaissance with the emphasis on uh, political liberties, um, what you get gradually is an increased absolutiz absolutization and idealization of the notion of individual freedom. You see, individual rights in the Enlightenment, creative self-expression with the Romanticist, until you get that absolute freedom of some of the existentialists like Sartre, who absolutizes freedom. You see? In fact, it seems to me that um, uh, there's, a, there's something running through the uh, American ethos which regards freedom as the highest of all values. Seems to me that's a very pagan idea. Um, from Judeo Christian standpoint, it's justice, not freedom, which is the highest of all social values. And freedom is just a subset of that. You see? Uh, but the, the emphasis so often in this good politics is to talk about freedom rather than justice. Well, um, the age of enlightenment then in, um, in those ways. Now, John Locke, uh, I'm suggesting, uh, fits uh, very much into this spirit of the enlightenment. Um, at the same time, um, there are other influences, of course, in his thinking. Uh, he, um, he's in the spirit of the Enlightenment, very much part of that scientific age, personal friend of Isaac Newton, picks up on the Newtonian model of particles of matter and applies it to his theory of ideas, as we'll see, and his social philosophy. The physical universe, you have indivisible particles of matter, atoms, combined and moved according to fixed laws, equal simple ideas, combined according to fixed laws of association. In his social philosophy, he has social atoms, individuals, joined together according to laws of a social contract. He has the same atomistic model as Newton had in his physics, he had it in his psychology, his epistemology, his social philosophy. Very much the same. Yet, at the same time, um, he has a Puritan heritage. His father was one of the signatories of the Westminster Confession of Faith, the classic Presbyterian document of the Counter-Reformation, 17th century. And something of that comes through, so that if you look, for instance, just at the opening paragraphs of our Locke selection, certainly of you have the book with you. Well, don't make that mistake next time. Okay, the Kaufman anthology. Um, if you look at the outset of that, this is, uh, this is where he starts. Um, he starts his essay on human understanding with this. An inquiry into the understanding pleasant and useful, since it is understanding that sets man above the rest of sensory beings, conscious beings, and gives him all the advantage and dominion that he has over them, it's certainly a subject even for its nobleness worth our labor to inquire into. Now, what is it that distinguishes humankind, you see? Uh, well, you say rationality, the Greeks were saying that, yes, uh, so is the Enlightenment, continuing that. But notice what else he says, it's this which gives him dominion over the rest of nature. There's that, uh, that Puritan reformed emphasis on a creation mandate that we saw in Bacon and the game in Hobbes, you see. Uh, uh, towards the end of that paragraph, he refers to all the light we can let in upon our own minds. The light, interesting figure of speech again, the light of reason. And on uh, 165, the top of the page when he's talking about method, he talks about searching for the bounds between opinion and knowledge. Between opinion and knowledge. Now that's an old platonic distinction that he reshapes and introduces into the Enlightenment. Knowledge has to be objective, has to be certain, has to be scientifically and logically guaranteed. Opinion, that's something different. And it's by means of this that he says we ought to regulate our assent and moderate our persuasions. You can control what you assent to. You can control your beliefs. You see, we're completely free to assent or dissent, to believe or not believe, in accordance with reason. You see. And um, then on uh, 165 in the second column, he has a section labeled what idea, the term idea, in quotes, stands for. And you notice uh, halfway through that paragraph, he remarks, that it stands for whatever is the object of understanding when a man thinks. Okay, now what are you thinking about when you think? Ideas. Ideas. You see, this is um, Descartes' kind of starting point. Uh, what you have is the mind directly aware of its own ideas. Okay, that's a starting point. And as it was for Descartes, so it is for Locke. Granted, all we know is our ideas. The question is, can we infer anything further about external things like uh, bodies, like other minds, like God? And these things outside of our own mind have to be demonstrated, have to be proven. You want scientific like proofs for that. You see. Or if you can't get those proofs, then all that you have is not knowledge, but opinions, beliefs. You see. And when um, David Hume becomes skeptical, he therefore raises questions about knowledge of bodies, knowledge of other minds, knowledge of God, knowledge even of one's own mind. So that Hume says that all we actually know is our own subjective ideas. You see. Oh, he, um, he believes we have bodies. He's inclined to believe to God. So far as he takes it. So, um, Locke, um, yes, at the beginning of uh, this whole movement. Then, um, one other preliminary observation. On 166 in the first column, he um, is arguing that we have no innate knowledge. We have no innate knowledge. It's plain thought. Everything we have comes through our senses. Everything we know comes through our senses. Formulating sensory ideas. Leading to ideas of our own reflections. Leading to more complex ideas. That we join together to form propositions and develop knowledge. But all of it comes from sense experience. 
Now, one of his reasons for insisting on that, rather than innate knowledge, is in effect that it would be an affront to God who gave us our senses to suppose that we cannot rely on them to tell us what things are. So, just as Descartes appealed to the Creator who had given us the mind so that we could trust the mind, Locke appeals to the God who gave us our senses so we could trust our senses. So, but if the underlying assumption in Locke's empiricism is the trustworthiness of the senses, you see, he at least has an underlying theological justification for that. Well, that's uh, purely introductory. Um, you, you see Locke as the beginning of the Enlightenment, and what he does in these pages really sets it up for Berkeley to make radical changes and for Hume to ditch the whole thing. Now, let me pause there for a moment. Yeah. I was talking about Hume earlier. I guess you were mentioning on your diagram, you yeah. were saying that he was questioning the whole thing. Did I understand you to say correctly that he understood, that he believed, he agreed with the ideas, and nobody was crossing out his own mind, questioning his own mind? Yeah. How yeah. did that idea without a mind? Well, you remember Descartes tried to prove that he had a mind. I think I have ideas. Therefore, I exist. A thinking thing. Now, to say I have a mind is to say I'm a thing. There is a thing there that thinks. Remember, Descartes' phrase was race cogitans, a thinking thing, where a, um, yeah. Uh, where race means a substantive entity, not physical, but an entity. Now, it's that entitative status, the notion of a mind substance, of a soul substance, that's in question. Descartes thought he proved it. Locke agrees with Descartes. He thinks you, um, if you think, it must be a thinking thing. Um, but Hume says, what? Right. Right. Um, I, all I know is that I'm a, that I, all I know is a bundle of perceptions, an array of ideas, interrelated, so that I'm conscious of. So all I know about the mind, if you want to be an empiricist, is that I'm a bundle of perceptions. And you say, well, something was going to be a bundle of perceptions. Well, you're going to dogmatize and say what it is. You're simply going to confess you don't know. Since you don't know. The alternatives, as he sees them, are dogmatism versus skepticism. The skeptic doesn't deny them as such. He says, I don't know. I don't know how to find out. You know? So, um, uh, this is up for grabs in him, along with other minds, along with bodies, and I. In other words, Hume is a skeptic about any metaphysical um, belief, or any metaphysical knowledge, I should say. A lot sets him up for. Okay, um, let's take a stab at his theory of ideas, shall we? A stab at his theory of ideas. The, um, the first thing that um, he does... Now, let me back up there. Um, notice the distinction between ideas and knowledge. Why is that? Well, um, he, he makes the point that um, knowledge consists in the addition or subtraction of ideas. So that if I say, for instance, um, all humans are mortal, okay, uh, what I'm doing is making a judgment, affirming a proposition, and all knowledge consists of propositions and judgments that have subject predicate form. Now, the subject and the predicate are different ideas. So you have idea one and idea two. The idea of humans. Yes, it's a generalized idea. Okay. The idea of mortality is the idea of a certain contingent quality that there is to life. It's a qualitative idea. But obviously, then, we only have knowledge if we have ideas. Knowledge refers to the judgments you make about your ideas. So he has to start with the theory of ideas. Where do we get our ideas? The first question. And his response is twofold. First, there are no innate ideas. And second, all ideas originate with the senses. Now, he has um, a lengthy section, we've got a goodly part of it in the anthology, um, in which he argues against innate ideas. That theory about innate ideas, uh, you remember from Plato, and in another form of it, in Descartes, his emphasis on clear and distinct ideas that are intuitive, natural to us, um, it's not altogether clear 